We got that? Okay. First off, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here today. That was a fantastic talk uh, beforehand, and it sort of comes to the conclusion of what this talk does, but we'll go through some of the evidence for a trans-catheter uh, approach to a valve in MAC. I don't really have any uh, conflicts of interest pertaining to this. I'm a proctor and uh, uh, advisor for uh, Edwards Life Sciences. Um, again, this is Athens, uh, and again, it's great being here. I come here a few times a year, and I hope the people who've come here for the first time get a chance to enjoy the city and the country. So why consider uh, a, a, tran a transcatheter mitral valve replacement in MAC? Well, we know surgery does not do well in these patients for a number of reasons. Uh, surgeons, and I'm not a surgeon, but surgeons do not like to get into that AV groove. It's very calcified, operative time, um, stroke risk. Um, debridement, um, you know, disrupting uh, the curtain, and paravivirial leak. And often these patients uh, are small women who are high risk, have renal insufficiency, other comorbidities, reduce. Th these are not the nice cases for surgeons to take on. So the interventionalists, led mostly by interventionalists, uh, did these cases and they felt that uh, they could do them successfully. And there are multiple reports in the literature of successful cases of valve and MAC. And as you can see, um, MAC comes in very many uh, different uh, shapes and sizes. And the posterior portion is the one that gets more calcified often, and that's why it's felt that we could anchor this, especially if there's a bioprosthetic valve in the aortic position, then potentially a percutaneous approach would be easy. So, and you can see from the list of authors here, many of them are well known in the TAVR world, they decided to take this on. And uh, this is one of the first uh, multi-center global registries. Average age, 73, you figure, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty young. It's a full 10 years younger than uh, the early partner studies. Uh, many of them are female, over 50%. You can see, though, the technical success was only 72%. And uh, you can see need for a second valve was 17%. And mortality, 30%, essentially. These are not good results. I mean, I actually delve into the numbers. 64 patients at 32 centers. There's only about you know, one to two uh, patients per center. So very limited experience by expert centers. What happens when they actually get a procedural complication? Well, in this, in this early data, any procedural complication, whether it was LVOT obstruction, embolization, perforation, almost always led in death. So, uh, again, this is not, um, is not really success in my mind. Updated one year uh, with more patients, 116, average age approximately 73. Uh, many of them with COPD, previous cabbage, previous AVR. Ejection fractions were fairly well preserved for the most part. STS scores in these patients were 15.3. And again, the one weakness of the STS score is it does not take into account technical applications in surgery. So going into a very calcified uh, uh, MAC, it's really not entered anywhere in uh, the STS. And when you look at the, the baseline data, many of them had uh, significant mitral regurgitation. And then when you look at 30 days in one year, you know, patients seem to do well. But again, take a look at the drop-off in numbers. These are the ones who survived. And again, is this considered success? Technical success was in the 70s, uh, significant amount of LVOT obstruction, valve embolization, and need for second valve, just like the first uh, batch. And once you cause obstruction, there is very much a problem, 84.6%. So uh, again, this is uh, the weakness of uh, doing a valve in MAC. And when you look at the registry, 30-day uh, mortality, 22%, compared to predicted 15.3, but that may even be an underestimate uh, given the types of patients in the intervention. And one-year mortality, 58%. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, if, if TAVR had initially had those uh, numbers, we would not be where we are today in TAVR. And the predictors of death are the sicker patients with heart failure, not having a technical successful procedure, LV, LVOT obstruction, any other complication. And these valves generally were sapien valves. They weren't meant in this space. And the approaches, you can see, were majority transapical and transeptal and some transatrial. And the case beforehand, Dr. Pizzas had shown, it's a fantastic uh, uh, showing of uh, an example of how to approach this. 
Again, adverse events. You can see 30 days, one year, uh, these patients didn't do well. So conclusion from the standard sort of minimalist approach to go in and do this, um, is it actually feasible? Very high mortality, LVOT obstruction is high predictor of mortality, Reinterventions after 30 days is low, but there's not so many patients left at 30 days. And uh, the, survi the survivors, as we call them, uh, actually did have uh, benefit from this procedure. So thinking about doing something in this space is a good idea, but how can we get to it um, get them through the 30 days, because clearly the Achilles heel is, is the hospitalization, is the actual procedure. And doing this with non-dedicated devices, in my mind, is not the way to go. A lot of these early studies did not fully utilize imaging to assess for LVOT obstruction, to assess for other things that could go wrong. And as clearly shown in the previous uh, talk, uh, this needs to be done. Risk factors for LVT obstruction um, run the host of uh, septal hypertrophy, elongated anterior leaflet, and that is an Achilles heel as well. And I'll, sp I'll speak to that this afternoon. And uh, the angle between the aortic and the mitral uh, annular planes. So a lot of this uh, goes into uh, can we get a successful procedure? And can we prevent this? Well, direct resection with transitrial approach definitely uh, helps, but they're on uh, bypass. Is that such a big deal for this type of procedure with the previous success? Maybe not. Uh, Pre-alcohol septal ablations can be carried out to help decrease that LVOT um, dynamic uh, obstruction to increase the flow through there and uh, prevent LVOT obstruction. And the lampoon procedure was just technically quite challenging, uh, especially in these sicker patients, uh, to accomplish. Can surgery play a role? Well, clearly it can, as shown before. Um, there's different uh, ways to utilize this, and not being a surgeon, I won't get into that as the previous speaker did, but clearly using some of these devices that were not meant for this and uh, putting a spin on them from a surgical point of view can be used. And you can see, as was shown earlier, and these are uh, courtesy of uh, Drs. Kemfort and uh, Matt Williams, and uh, where they're using the same similar techniques that were shown earlier uh, with sizing, pledging, and anchoring. Because again, embolization is still an issue with uh, MAC. And using even the Lotus valve, and it's already ready to go. And uh, uh, again, similar technique. So when we look at the challenges, um, we have to avoid futility. And I think a lot of these patients with a STS score of over 15%, that means many of them had STS scores of over 20. The approach that has been outlined in the registry is not the approach to go. In my mind, that's a failed procedure. Uh, with utilizing it as an interventional approach only with non-dedicated devices. Uh, if we are gonna do them, we have to assess the full degree of calcification sizing using CT imaging uh, to assess what the Neo LVOT is gonna look like. Positioning is an issue. Obstruction, of course, regurgitation, thrombotic risk. And we did not have enough of these patients survive to fully understand that. But in my mind, with all this equipment coming out into the LVOT, we have to worry about thrombotic risk. Uh, delayed malpositioning, again, we can get over that by suturing and anchoring these valves in. And we don't know the durability of these valves. So is it worth it? Um, I guess jumping off a cliff, uh, initially sounds like a good idea. When you're halfway through it, you don't know if it's a good idea, and when you safely land, it is. So uh, I, I uh, say with extreme caution to approach a valve in MAC, and I believe that uh, without dedicated valves, which uh, Dr. Carr will be speaking about uh, in, uh, after this, uh, I think uh, you really need a surgical, combined surgical interventional approach to do these cases successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valiano. Uh, do you think, although we're not going to go to the discussion now, but do you think is it possible to develop dedicated devices since you know, the volume of the patient is not something that will probably uh, interest? I, 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 you know, if you look back 10 years ago when we started TAVI programs, we didn't think we'd be doing this, what we're doing now. So I think absolutely. We're still going to have to deal with that anterior uh, leaflet, uh, and that's going to be an issue. So hopefully some of the devices will take that into account. So I think eventually we'll get there. But I think with the present equipment, uh, it's really a no-go zone in my mind. It's just the technical success is not high enough uh, to do this. And I don't think we're doing our patients uh, a service. We have to be very careful. That's my opinion.